Let's revise space physics. Starting off with our solar system, we need to know that within our solar system, there's obviously just one star, which is the sun. There are also eight planets, and we also have quite a few dwarf planets, and our solar system is part of the Milky Way galaxy. The star actually formed. Well, it all starts from an interstellar dust and gas cloud that drawn together by the force of gravity. The temperature eventually rises, causing fusion reactions. The fusion actually leads to an equilibrium between the expansion of the star and the gravitation that is trying to collapse it. What is the life cycle of a star? Well, we're going to split this into two. First of all, let's have a look at the life cycle of a star with a size similar to that of the sun. It's going to start off from an interstellar dust and gas nebula. Eventually, it will turn into a protostar, which starts glowing, but is not actually producing nuclear fusion. And then once fusion reactions begin, we have a main sequence star, which is in equilibrium. When the hydrogen fuel runs out, the star will turn into a red giant, and then eventually into a white dwarf, and then a very, very long time afterwards into a black dwarf. Now, stars which are much more massive than the sun will follow a similar path. From a main sequence star, they're going to turn into a red supergiant, and then afterwards a supernova explosion will take place, and then the star will either turn into a black hole or a neutron star, depending on the mass. A couple of important points that fusion processes actually produce all the naturally occurring uh, elements, so all the chemical elements are produced within fusion. For instance, in, at the most basic level, hydrogen will fuse into helium, and so on and so forth, upwards in the periodic table. Now, the very heavy elements, though, there's uh, not enough energy for this to happen, so they tend to occur in supernovae explosions. The, these explosions actually distribute the elements throughout the universe. Now let's talk about orbits. Gravity is actually the force that allows planets and satellites to maintain their circular or elliptical orbits. Now for circular orbits, the force of gravity actually can lead to changing velocity but unchanging speed. Now, the reason why this happens is because the actual direction changes. So let's say that I have something like the sun or a star, and then we have a planet across here. It's the actual direction that will change along the orbit. So let's say that here is pointing this way, here is pointing this way, but the magnitude of the speed will be remaining exactly the same. Now, for a stable orbit, if the speed is going to change, the radius must change. And let's also have a look at redshift. Now, there's an increase in wavelength of light from distant galaxies. In a way, the wavelengths are essentially being stretched. And this increase in wavelength is proportional to the relative speed of the galaxies to us. So this entire effect is what is known as red shift. And this means that this is one of the major pieces of evidence the universe is expanding, and this supports the theory of the Big Bang. A couple of bits about that theory, uh, it suggests that the universe began from a very small region, it was extremely hot and dense, and we have a multitude of evidence on that. So from 1998 onwards, loads of observations of supernova suggest that the uh, distant galaxies are receding faster, meaning that the expansion of the universe is at a faster rate than it, we initially thought. There's loads of things that we don't understand about the universe. For instance, we don't really know what is fueling that expansion. So we've given it a name dark energy. We don't know what keeps galaxies together. So we've called it dark matter. And there's loads to be explored. And this is really, really exciting. Well done on revising an entire subtopic in GCSE physics. Have a look at this next one to help you get the maximum score in your exams.